Okay, maybe a good idea. It's, it's a good idea. If we start recording now, I go back one step. Um, just to repeat the first sentence. Uh, so ed education, uh, the English term education is uh, hardly translatable to Bildung, which is a common term in the German speaking discussion. And that's a good point to start uh, reflecting realities, media, and the becoming of a person. As you probably know, um, <clears throat> uh, Bildung, or what, you would, what is the next term in English, is a becoming of a person. Uh, the debate of, on Bildung usually starts with uh, ideas um, uh, presented by Wilhelm von. Uh, von Humboldt. <clears throat> Interestingly, Humboldt was not an educational scientist, uh, but uh, he was a language researcher. Uh, so he, he wrote a little bit about uh, education and uh, I think about 10 books about languages. One thing he discovered when researching languages is uh, exactly the uh, aspect I started with. Uh, there are terms in languages you can't translate to other languages. <clears throat> uh, because of this uh, difficulty to translate terms from one language to another, uh, Humboldt developed a theory where he described languages as truth systems. So he stated that uh, every language constitutes a truth system, which obviously refers to things like culture or nation, which was an important topic uh, during Humboldt's lifetime, uh, and things like that. <clears throat> so his, his idea is mainly uh, that you have uh, not a language, one term of language uh, that is suitable to reflect all languages, but uh, you have a network of languages. The interesting point uh, Humboldt made is that you as a person are able to learn another language. Uh, and once you learned another language, you are able to move into that language. You can even go to a, a different uh, nation, to a different country, live there, uh, acquire the culture, and uh, reach uh, a high level of understanding of that language. Uh, I, I forgot how many languages Humboldt himself learned, but there were quite a lot. <clears throat> so the interesting uh, claim he made is that this movement between languages from lang one language to another, uh, that is Bildung. Because uh, if you move between these languages or language systems, uh, you need to reflect yourself in the light of these different languages. So Bildung means moving between these uh, different languages, or as we might say today, between these different realities that are uh, created within these languages. The consequences of that are quite obvious. First consequences, since this is a movement between languages, you can't really express this in a language, because as soon as you talk about language, what I'm doing now is, um, this, this does not really um, catch this movement uh, because this movement is something aside of languages. So you, building is something you can uh, hint at, what I'm doing now, uh, but you can't really get and describe this fully in a language. Uh, that, that's one of the reasons why it's, it is usually claimed that you can't research uh, building with empirical methods, because as soon as you use an empirical method, uh, you need to apply a language to describe what you see. But you can't describe this process in a language because it's beside languages. Second important um, <clears throat> position here is that uh, this obviously suggests that you, as a subject, uh, you constitute yourself as a subject beside languages. 
in other words, you can't be created by a language, so you are not constituting yourself as a subject within a language, but you are constituting yourself as a subject while moving between languages. <clears throat> so you as a subject are always kind of independent from languages. Uh, this type of theory <clears throat> that uh, assumes uh, a difference, for uh, a basic difference in this case between subject and languages, these types of theories are called dualistic theories. <clears throat> and these types of theories, dualistic theories are very typical uh, for at least traditional uh, educational thinking. <clears throat> Um, this understanding of building shows a uh, contrast to uh, understandings of education uh, that are focused on something like, a, as, you say, as we said before, acquiring information. Information is obviously something within a language. Uh, and um, <clears throat> uh, you, you can't um, uh, understand uh, what, what people are doing with these informations within this language, because they are always also kind of besides the language, reflecting languages, understanding languages, or using languages. Okay. <clears throat> so one contrast that is uh, relevant here is the difference between language and information. And that's relevant if it comes to uh, digital media and uh, understanding of digital media and educational processes, since uh, digital media are heavily connected to uh, the term information and the understanding of information. And I assume I can keep the next statement short, since you're probably aware of, uh, of that. Uh, the information, the, the term information as it is used today mainly has been established by Claude Shannon. You are probably aware of this uh, communication model that has been suggested of Shannon and Weaver. Um, <clears throat> the, the more important uh, argument in their research research was developed by Shannon. Uh, Shannon developed an understanding, a definition of information that was a starting point of uh, all uh, mathematical information theory. And the important point in his information theory is that he developed an understanding of information that reflected recent developments um, at his time, recent developments uh, at his time. No, they were actually, they were already a, a little bit older. It started already at the end of the 19th century by Boltzmann, but it was uh, 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 improved quite a bit in the next uh, decades. His term of information uh, is based on understandings of entropy. Um, and uh, the core idea of entropy is that you, of this understanding of entropy is that you do not describe reality by precise measurements, but by probabilities. So he changed the idea of a precise measurement of realities by the idea of describing reality by probabilities. And that's the core of his understanding of information. As you uh, probably know, uh, the uh, definition of Shannon is the reduction of uncertainty. Information is the reduction of uncertainty. If you have, for example, a language and uh, you have, uh, uh, for example, a letter in a word and you want to predict the next letter, um, then you would probably predict the most, prob most probable next letter. For In German, for example, you, you would always say the next letter is most probably E, because E's are quite often in German. Um, his claim now is that the uh, 
uh, amount of information that is transported uh, with this E is very low because uh, the uh, predictability of the E is very high. So as lower the probability for a letter is, as higher is the information. Okay, that's the understanding of, of Shannon of uh, information and uh, a term that has become very influential, uh, um, most probably because uh, Shannon also suggested that you can express every information on a scale uh, that only makes one difference. So the idea of uh, digitalization uh, the difference of zero and one has been developed of Shannon in this uh, information theory. Uh, and well, we are talking about digital media, but you can also say Shannon media because uh, digital media are uh, media that are based on this concept developed by Shannon. So pretty influential uh, concept. This concept is connected to um, to another idea um, that has been suggested by Norbert Wiener. Uh, he, he was the uh, mentor of Shannon. Uh, well, they were not, uh, uh, they did not agree in all uh, aspects of their research, but uh, on some main ideas, uh, they certainly did. Uh, <clears throat> Norbert Wiener used this term, uh, this understanding of uh, information that was uh, expressed by Shannon and connected it to uh, the theory of cybernetics and connected it to the uh, idea of the control loop. So the basic idea uh, Venus suggested is that uh, he understood human beings as information processing systems. He at the same time understood the world uh, like animals, trees and so on as information processing systems. And he considered machines as information processing systems. So you have one single idea, the definition of information that is suitable to understand just everything, human beings, the world, machines, uh, <clears throat> whatever. These types of theories that start with a single idea, just one single term, uh, are called monistic theories. Okay, so uh, what we have is uh, a contrast between dualistic theories and monistic theories. I, I come back to this uh, later on. Important here is um, that Wiener sees, saws the, the same structure in machine and man and the world at large. Uh, you are probably aware of, of ideas like uh, the, the uh, transhumanism. So the idea that it will be possible in, let's say, I think the actual claim is in about five years is that it will be possible to download, download uh, human thinking into a computer since computers. This claim only makes sense if you understand computer technology and human beings with the same structure and the same theory. From a dualistic point of view, this idea is obviously nonsense because there is an essential difference between machines and human beings. But since well, transhumanism, you are pretty aware of, uh, probably aware of this idea, which is proposed by Kurzweil, which is a chief developer uh, at Google. So a pretty influential person. And it's quite debated a lot. And there are lots of people believing that it will be possible that uh, computers, uh, that we will be able to download our mind to computers, that computers will uh, even can think, computers can think, uh, and computers can learn. You've probably heard of this term uh, of terms like uh, learning algorithms or learning machines or stuff like that. Okay, based on this uh, concept, uh, there uh, was uh, 
uh, a learning theory developed, which is called behaviorism. Uh, I assume you all, uh, you probably heard about behaviorism. In behaviorism, human behavior is uh, assumed as statistically predictable. Uh, and the uh, basic, uh, uh, one, one basic assumption with that is that you can predict future behavior, um, future behavior um, based on the observation of uh, observed behavior. So the predictable, you, uh, uh, one basic claim of cybernetics is that you can predict the future. Okay, so a predictable future. Uh, <clears throat> one consequence of this is that you uh, that uh, human beings uh, are understood as something that is con uh, controlled by information, and the technology to control human beings is the control loop. So the control loop is a central concept uh, in cybernetics. You see an example of uh, control loops here. I assume you know control loops uh, for um, <clears throat> uh, for human beings. You you use uh, technologies like uh, operant. Uh, conditioning so uh, you uh, you know this is this experiment with pigeons you feed uh, pigeons something and you increase the probability of a behavior you do not uh, give them rewards and you decrease the probability of uh, the behavior same strategy is often suggested for um, educational processes so for example in um, as approaches to serious games, one of the major uh, advantages of serious games is that uh, learners receive um, positive rewards quite often. So um, giving positive re rewards uh, is a technology to control uh, the behavior of people and obviously you do this by measuring their behavior and uh, delivering the rewards afterwards and the structure uh, that is behind this is uh, the control loop okay uh, i should should add here that um no no not so important. Well, from the other point of view, so, so from dualistic point of view, uh, there's uh, one major difference between human beings and machines. And the major difference is human beings live. We are living beings. Machines are dead. And the uh, well, kind of provocative claim is we do not teach dead people. So why should we teach machines or assume that uh, machines can learn that people can't learn? Pretty obvious. So we have a little contrast here and I, I go back to the other side to, to give you an idea where the, the uh, alternative uh, comes from. <clears throat> uh, I assume you are uh, aware of uh, these two persons, uh, Immanuel Kant and Friedrich Schiller. Um, on, um, <clears throat> in their perspective, um, uh, the, 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 core, the core objective uh, or the, the core strategy to become a person is not to acquire information, but to play. That's quite interesting. Um, so uh, Schiller in the 18th century suggested that uh, people are only uh, in the full sense of the uh, full meaning of the word people uh, if they play. So he suggested uh, and, and he developed a, a, a sound theory of, of play. He suggested that play is the car method uh, that gives us the possibility to uh, become a person. The reason for that is that you are free if you play. The reason for this is that uh, your, your play, your games are not controlled by uh, an 
external authority like the state or religion. So nobody is controlling your reason. That's the first reason. So you are free of external influences from society. And the second reason is that you do not um, earn money while playing. You do not um, uh, <clears throat> grow crops to get food uh, if you play. <clears throat> and that's still in the debate, the major difference between play and work. If you earn money with your, while playing, you are not playing, uh, you're working. You only start to play if there's no external reason for what you're doing uh, in your action. Okay, so human beings are considered as players. Uh, they are not controlled by other people's reasoning. They're free to think. And in this, uh, their behavior is unpredictable. So uh, human beings are considered as creative. It's pretty difficult to uh, predict the behavior of uh, creative people. So contrast to, for, uh, for example, atoms is quite... Uh, obvious uh, atoms do not change yeah, their mind while you're observing them, people do. So learners uh, sometimes uh, behave, they do what they're asked for for a while and then they say, okay, I changed my mind, I don't want to do this anymore, I'm now doing something completely different. And you can't predict when this is happening. Um, <clears throat> This perspective is usually called humanism. And uh, in the last two years, uh, uh, a new development came up, which is called uh, digital humanism. And digital humanism uh, put this idea of um, uh, self-controlled people, free thinking, at the, at the center, and uh, I, I just have a little citation from the Manifesto on Digital Humanism. Uh, the statement is, we must shape technologies in accordance with human values and needs instead of allowing technologies to shape humans. So the contrast that is debated uh, in the moment is uh, that there is a strong tendency to apply computer technology to control humans by these uh, strategies I stated before. <clears throat> and this is contrasted with the idea to uh, uh, support human beings in becoming a person and in becoming able to shape to technologies in accordance with their needs. So at this point, I would like to, to start a, a second group discussion uh, about the, just a second. I have to, it's a bit difficult sometimes if I run a presentation to, 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 to get out of this. Uh, ah, here we are. Okay, uh, I would like to start a second group discussion on the question, uh, what digital competencies should be taught in schools? Okay, digital competencies that should be uh, taught in schools. I just take a look I think at the rooms. I think some people dropped, so I need to reorganize uh, the sessions. Just a second, okay. That should be it. Here we are. Uh, same place before, two minutes per person.
aby se ten pán říkal, jak to normálně. Jako. Yeah, no. So. Ah, welcome, profesor. <laughs> welcome back. Uh, somehow my video got turned off. Um, just one uh, as before uh, two ideas. Um, maybe uh, the Oracle says room 12. That is uh, uh, Jana, Martin and Bava. Maybe uh, Jana. Okay, Can I'm you hear here. Me? Can you hear me? Yeah, fine. Okay, uh, the question was, uh, what digital technical competencies should we, should we be taught at school? Yeah. Well, um, among those technologies, for, uh, of course, should be all technologies or the competencies of 21st century, which is collaboration, cooperation, problem solving, oh, uh, literacies, information literacies, and all of this. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, <clears throat> a pretty common claim. Uh, maybe one other statement. Uh, how about the room, room eight? That's uh, Peter, um, Lucy. Lucy, is Lucy correct? Lucy Tomanova? It's Lucia. Lucia. Okay. So what do you uh think? We had a discussion about whether to focus on hardware or software, because uh, maybe we have learned in primary schooling that uh, we more focused on hardware because technology wasn't as developed as it, it is now. And okay. we talked about information literacy as maybe of what is more important to teach now than uh, what used to be maybe 10, 15 years ago. Yeah, perfect. Thank you very much. <clears throat> two, two pretty good claims that and indeed reflect the debate on uh, digital literacies quite a bit. So what I would like to do now is uh, use a perspective I offered so far and, and uh, take a step back to uh, take a look at these claims. And to do that, I need to start my presentation again. Maybe before you start, um, yeah. I don't know if you saw it, there is a question in chat, which uh, came out before the breakout room. So uh, I don't know, maybe before we... Ah, yeah, on. if the process is both sided, that's that interesting. Uh, well, uh, <clears throat> it, it depends what you, what you exact, uh, of, of course, the details are a bit uh, uh, um, tricky. Uh, it, it, it depends on what you mean by both sided. If you mean that both sided means that, that technologies shape humans and humans shape technologies, um, then you assume that, that technologies have something like a free will that they want to shape <clears throat> the future needs of humans and that they bring in <clears throat> that they bring in their ideas uh, into uh, the development of human societies okay so that that's that's a, a position that is for example uh, suggested by uh, bruno latour and the in the actor network theory uh, where where a uh, uh, both sided process is assumed uh, from from my point of view and you probably have already guessed that i like this humanistic position from my point of view uh, technologies do not have a free will. The technologies do not have an idea of how to shape the future. Uh, technologies are created by people. Um, so uh, like, uh, for example, Shannon. Shannon developed this idea and Turing picked up these ideas and developed his uh, uh, suggestion of uh, universal processing machines as universal Turing machines. So there are people that create these technologies and they, uh, by creating these technologies, they communicate something to other people. So, uh, if you use uh, 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 something like that, uh, uh, a digital uh, chewing machine in von Neumann architecture, 
like all computers we are using, digital universal Turing machines and phenomenon architecture, you are picking up the ideas that are put into the technologies by the creators of the technology. So, uh, yes, you can understand the process as both sided, and many people do so. That's uh, quite possible. Uh, you can you can consider the process as one-sided, so technology is shaping people, and uh, one-sided, the other way around, people are shaping technology. Uh, so the meaning is, I mean, with, with sorry, I have to read that. I mean that with innovation comes with more opportunities than we didn't know about. So it opens new ways humans can develop. Yes. Uh, um, <clears throat> Obviously, if you create something like a digital environment, you are creating new possibilities. You are creating um, <clears throat> new, new, new ways to develop. Um, I would doubt that these new ways are not uh, not not um, completely unknown. So, if if you read the suggestions by chewing, the ideas by chewing, the ideas that uh, Wiener has published in his books about cybernetics, uh, then it becomes clear that what is happening today has been seen by these people. So they did this uh, on purpose. It, it did not just happen. Uh, what they can't, couldn't really predict and determine is how we are using uh, the technologies. So uh, yes, there are possibilities you can uh, use technologies uh, against the idea of the inventor. Uh, the, the problem is that you can't go behind the possibilities of universal Turing machines. So if you use a computer that is built as a digital machine, you need to communicate in a digital format, period. If you use a computer that is built as a universal Turing machine, you need to use it as a digital Turing machine. What you always can do is you can say, okay, uh, I see the ideas that are connected with these machines, and I don't like them. I don't want to communicate this way with other people. It's disturbing my communication. I want to get rid of it. That's a possibility you have. The interesting point is that you, uh, by doing that, you can't really pass, uh, throw away all media. Obviously, if you want to communicate with other people, you need to use some media. You need to use uh, spoken language. You need to use gestures, mimic. Uh, you need to use uh, written words, print, uh, TV, radio, whatever. So there are different opportunities. Uh, and you can choose which of these um, <clears throat> technologies meet your demands. And what you can also do is if you say, OK, I see all these different media that are around, but well, I really would prefer something else. Uh, then you can start creating something new. So you are not bound to this, uh, techno these technologies. So you, you see, uh, the, the answer to the suggestions uh, would be yes, uh, especially since you are able to choose and design media. Okay, that <laughs> that answered my answers my next question. My next question uh, would have been if that answers your question. Obviously, it does. Thank you very much. So, uh, <clears throat> picking up the train of thought, uh, and it connects pretty good to to what I just said and and what you said before. Uh, uh, one difference I want to uh, show you is the difference between the OECD. Uh, and the 21st century skills that already have been have, have been mentioned, and the concept of the United Nations, which is labeled media and information literacy. Um, <clears throat> 
as you probably know, uh, the OECD uh, is not really a, a democratic institution. Uh, it's a connection of um, uh, countries that uh, are supporting the idea of capitalism. So uh, uh, the OECD uh, has a strong focus on uh, economy and considerably on capitalistic economy. So the idea, uh, the basic idea that is transported by the OECD, uh, they do not state that, but the, the uh, basic idea is that information is a private property that can be sold. So producing and selling information is the basic idea that is behind the uh, concept behind the concepts published by the OECD and behind the concept of uh, the 21st century skills. The concept of the 21st century skills is picked up by the European Commission in Europe uh, and they uh, label their version of this uh, the DICOM concept. Uh, but this is uh, heavily connected to this uh, idea of the OECD that information uh, it's a private property that can be owned. So information uh, is connected to ownership, uh, that this is something that can be sold. Obviously, this is not exactly a new idea. This is a driving force behind uh, most of the media systems we have. And the idea has started uh, already in the uh, dark ages in the 16th centuries, uh, <clears throat> by uh, the Fugger. I'm, I'm not aware of, of uh, Fugger was a, a kind of a, a bank, an important bank in 16th centuries. Uh, it, it became uh, uh, pretty connected to globalization in 1845 uh, when telegraphs were established uh, since the uh, information that were uh, um, transmitted through telegraphs, where well, you had to pay for it, and this information could be sold. So the idea of making money by information is uh, some, some centuries old. Uh, it's still a basic force. Uh, what is sold today uh, is, is uh, a, 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 one aspect of that, and uh, this aspect is attention. So lots of people say we live in an attention economy and attention is generated by media. So uh, uh, a smartphone, for example, is used to uh, attract your attention. That's one of the basic uh, objectives of uh, social media companies. They want to attract your attention. Uh, and this attention is their product. So they use, use these machines to produce attention, your attention, uh, and then they are able um, to sell this attention to customers. Um, <clears throat> um, so if you turn on your smartphone or any other digital device, most of digital devices are connected to uh, uh, bigger companies somehow. If you turn on your dig digital device, you turn yourself into a product. Uh, and this product is uh, obviously owned by the owner, by the owner of the company. So your attention is not something you're, se you're, you're selling yourself, you're, you, you are not making any money from that, but the owner of the company makes money uh, by that. Uh, I probably do not have to explain uh, the uh, obvious analysis of this structure uh, to you. Uh, you, are, you, are, you live in a former communist country, so you are probably aware of the theories of Karl Marx. And it's pretty obvious uh, that uh, he is a private ownership of means of production is the uh, core strategy to generate profit. So. Uh, the uh, concept of the 21st century skills of the OECD uh, is focused on getting people to accept this structure and to um, um, be willing to live in a structure like that. 
Uh, so the a basic a basic focus is that people should be able to serve this technology structure to be useful in this uh, technology structure or as the OECD claims it uh, be successful on the labor market. So, but well, that's not pretty, uh, very astonishing. Probably you are aware that you live in a capitalist country and that this is the basic structure of capitalism. So it's uh, not really astonishing that this structure is reflecting, reflected in the debate about uh, digital competencies. So that's the idea of the OECD. Uh, the uh, suggestion of the United Nation um, on media and information literacy uh, is based on Article 19 of the Declaration of Human Rights. And uh, I, I have a sentence from the uh, Article 19 of the Declaration of Human Rights that is, everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression. These rights include freedom to hold opinions without interfering and to seek receive and impart information and ideas through any media and regardless of frontiers. So according to the human rights, and obviously that's the basic document for the United Nations, uh, according to the human rights, you should be free to read uh, any information you want. You should be free to express any information uh, or opinion you want uh, without any interference. Uh, it's probably easy to see the difference uh, to the idea that um, attention uh, and uh, data gathered about people is something that can be sold. Because as soon as it uh, is um, observed as something that is sold, uh, the idea of freedom is uh, kind of uh, um, cancelled. Yeah, so we, we have a contrast of this, uh, of, of both uh, of, the, of these ideas here. Um, <clears throat> another example would be uh, if, if Facebook uh, controls your communication, they prohibit the freedom of expression. They prohibit the freedom of opinion. Of course, if I ask for a freedom of opinion and expression, I have to uh, keep in. I have to uh, um, keep in mind that there will be expressions and opinions I don't like. Obviously, this suggesting to follow this uh, article nine. 19 of the Declaration of Human Rights, I suggest that other people uh, present uh, opinions that stay in strong contrast to what I'm saying. If you control everything, uh, you wouldn't debate other opinions, you just turn them off or control them. So these tendons, the tendency that is connected to uh, a consequence of cybernetics, of uh, understanding everything uh, as information, and of the thinking of um, um, <clears throat> uh, information as something that can be sold, is a totalitarian tendency. So there, there are slight, there, um, this, is, this is not really astonishing because this is based on monistic theories. As I said before, uh, monistic theories just have one starting point. So you know how to understand the world, you know how the world should be, and you know how it will be in the future. And if you know that, you can steer the world in that direction. Uh, <clears throat> So that's one idea behind this information theory. Uh, uh, the economic theories have the same tendency in uh, economic theories. It's the market. The market does everything. The market uh, uh, brings us into the future. We just have to follow the market. If we follow the market and what the market does, then everything will be right. So a free market 
not free people. A free market is the best we can do for human beings because the market wants that everything goes into the right direction. That is very, that's a very strong belief uh, in economic theories. If, if, you're, if you do not uh, study economics, it might look a bit strange, but everybody in economics uh, accepts this idea. And uh, so it's uh, pretty obvious uh, why the OECD um, uh, proposes these uh, ideas. Uh, so the, we have a contrast uh, between, um, on the one hand, uh, OECD 21st century skills, uh, the preparation of people for the labor market. And we have uh, the other idea, United Nations Media and Information Literacy. And the basic idea is to prepare people for communicating in uh, a democratic public sphere. So the public sphere is an idea that is connected pretty strong um, <clears throat> to these uh, suggestions of the United Nations. And you are probably aware uh, of the theory of the public sphere of Habermas. And this theory is again connected to uh, the ideas of Kant. So these ideas of, of free public um, um, statements, free, free public uh, exchange of opinions and expressions that that's more or less a word word by word citation of uh, uh, the famous uh, paper of Kant on what is enlightenment quite interesting this idea is pretty old okay so I, I just wanted to offer a, a, a perspective to reflect um, on uh, digital uh, digital uh, competencies on media and information literacy in fact, you can obviously easily combine both uh, because uh, being you, and this is also already uh, suggested by Kant, um, <clears throat> you, you can be useful uh, for a company and still um, uh, make use of your right for, for, for the freedom of expression. There's no contrast. I can even do something if I work for the government. Well, I'm paid by the government. Yeah, I can work for the government and still say I don't like what the government does. Well, I'm I'm forced to do it because that's my job. I'm paid for it. But well, I can still uh, start a public debate on it. That's not a contradiction. It it uh, supports each other if you put it this way. But. In the public debate, in the moment you have these two strands, so it's uh, pretty helpful to bear, be aware of these two strands. And if you ever come into the situation of uh, um, <clears throat> uh, teaching uh, something like digital literacy, download this document and on media and information literacy by the United Nations. <laughs> it's a better option if you ask me. Okay, <clears throat> so. Uh, next perspective. Next perspective. Um, these, these, as you might have seen, um, these two uh, perspectives uh, are kind of uh, um, an expression of two different realities. Like what I what I what I said when I started with Humboldt. Different languages are constituting different worlds. We have the same structure here. The belief on human beings and human rights, which is a constitutional element uh, of the uh, human rights, uh, that, that's constituting one um, reality. And we have the idea of the market as a driving force. This idea is constitute, constituting a different reality. And as I stated before, you as a person, you can live in both realities, change between these realities, uh, uh, act in this one, act in this one from time to time. And that might uh, uh, even suggest uh, or, or foster a reflection process. Well, the interesting thing is that there are not just these two realities around, uh, there are a bit more. <clears throat> um, so one, one basic distinction uh, I started with is uh, 
uh, are the two realities. Uh, we, from, we, we can't go behind my humble opinion. Um, we have the world, which is a reality, and we have our thinking, which is another reality. We can think about the world, but you are uh, certainly aware of the fact that thinking about the world uh, and trying to get the thinking of the world to match the world is pretty difficult. Uh, you just have to take a look at the de development of, of science in the last uh, 300 years. Uh, ideas are changing, so our description of the world uh, are changing. Uh, our realities are changing. The world does not. <laughs> the world is pretty cool about our thinking. It does not react on it, but we, we, uh, well, we have two realities and uh, we are kind of combining them. Of course, the, the car the core difference here uh, is uh, a slight difference uh, towards the, the presentation I made because you see the brain. Uh, uh, well, obviously, your thinking uh, does not match your brain. There's a difference between because the brain, the, 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 the nervous uh, apparatus, uh, your, your cells, uh, they are in the world. Your thinking is not. If you use language, um, it's, uh, there's a, uh, a difference between your brain and the world. Just one simple example. If I show you uh, the, the picture of an apple, I don't have an apple at hand in the moment. If I show you, if I show you the picture of an apple, uh, you wouldn't bite into the picture because you understand that this picture is referring to an apple, sign theory, uh, Charles Sanders Peirce. So, uh, so you're, you're, you have a difference between the sign and what, is, uh, what the sign means. The same difference exists between your brain and your thinking. And as you see, this, this is, uh, for, for example, a written word, word, a written word, and the meaning of the word is arbitrary. You can give a word any meaning. Of course, we have some conventions in culture and language and so on, okay, but you can create new words and stuff like that. Same happens with your brain. So the core difference is between your thinking and your brain. Okay, two realities. Um, in media, uh, we have uh, some more realities. Uh, usually you can uh, make a difference between a print world, media reality of print, uh, TV, no radio is first, radio, uh, second reality is radio, third reality is TV, fourth reality is cinema, no, wrong, <laughs> historically wrong. Uh, sequence again, not so important, and digital media. With digital media, it becomes a bit more difficult because any application you start creates an uh, own world. And as you are probably aware of, all of these uh, realities, media realities, have their own languages. In newspapers, you have a different language than in cinema. In cinema, you have a different language than in Facebook. In Facebook, you have a different language than on Twitter. And on Twitter, you have a different language than on a, a TV channel. So we have different media realities. The advantage is that you can move between these different realities and thus uh, develop yourself as a person by doing so. So moving behind, uh, between these realities is a good opportunity for building. Uh, the disadvantage is, and that is today, uh, as it seems to me, a major challenge. Uh, the disadvantage is uh, that there is no one common reality. There's not a single reality we all share. There's not the right reality, but there are different realities. 
So what you need to consider if you accept this structure is you always need to respect that other people live in other realities. And the contrast, well, the contrast is, is um, um, uh, pretty easy to explain for you because uh, um, the idea of a single reality uh, that should uh, be the, the basic for education was suggested by a famous Czech bishop. Uh, uh, in German, it's Comenius. As far as I remember, the uh, Czech name is Komensky. Um, <clears throat> and he suggested that uh, school uh, should teach people the single unit truth of the single true church. He was a bishop. Um, so he, he suggested one reality, one God that uh, kind of uh, includes all the different religion and uh, people should be brought to uh, believe in this single religion. And he suggested uh, an interesting technology for that, and that's print. He suggested to use print to communicate this single truth knowledge to kids. Print was a pretty new technology at his at his time, and he to do that he invented a pretty new format, and that is called a textbook. Comenius invented textbooks for that. So textbooks in school are connected to the idea of a single truth. And as you are probably aware of, textbooks are still pretty common in school. And one effect is, you, you know, these printing machines, they produce same copies. All the copies look the same. So you can communicate the same idea to everybody. That's the message of print. And that's the message Comenius picked up and it, it, it met his religious idea. So he used this technology to communicate uh, his religious ideas to schools by establishing textbooks. And this is still working. Now we have compute, we have this uh, 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 media ensemble, all these different media and considerably with computer technologies and all these applications, lots of different media worlds. So the idea of the single choose uh, becomes, well, it, it's not so convincing anymore. It's not so convincing anymore. So the challenge is not to accept these one truths, but to be able to handle all these different realities. So there's one type of realities I want to, to present to you and um, uh, suggest to move between these media realities. And if it comes to teaching and learning this media, uh, ask people to move between these media realities. And uh, one simple trick for that uh, is, for example, uh, to um, read a paper, uh, to read a newspaper, read an article in the newspaper, uh, and create uh, a radio contribution from that. To do that, you need to translate from the media reality of the newspaper, so you, you need to translate the content from the newspaper reality to the radio reality. And it is, it is exactly this translation process. It's obviously, media do, do, don't do that. It's this translation process that is important for the becoming of a person. OK, that's one, one um, um, perspective on realities. Uh, on the bottom of the screen, you, you see uh, pictures for a third uh, perspective on realities. That, that's connected to uh, the value spheres uh, from the theories of Weber. Uh, Weber, Weber like, like Humboldt, Weber stated there are different value spheres in societies. And he made a difference between uh, uh, the, the state, so political power, that's the first sphere, Second sphere is economy, money. Uh, third sphere is arts. Fourth uh, sphere is the uh, uh, law system. Um, 
fourth, uh, fifth sphere is um, well, he said erotic, the erotic sphere. Uh, I'm not sure if he if he connected this to also to ideas of family or so, but not so important. Uh, next sphere is scientific sphere. Uh, then you have the religious sphere. That's what what Weber stated, and I felt it, it's it's that was an, a kind of a, an accident. I I I've, uh, four years ago I thought I shot at the military sphere. Uh, as an uh, seventh, one, two, three, four, five, six, as an eighth sphere here, uh, I don't have to argue the relevance of this today. Okay, Weber's argument is that all of these spheres constitutes their own idea of truth. So you have different ideas of truth. In the public sphere, uh, the criterion for choose is power. If you gain power, you are right. If you lose power, you are wrong. It's easy in the economy. If you make money, you are right. It doesn't matter how you make money. As long as you make money, you are right. In science, it's uh, the method. You need to produce uh, knowledge according to a research method. As long as you can uh, produce knowledge according to a research method, uh, you're right. Okay, so you see, you have, you have different ideas of truth. Uh, and that's pretty helpful if you analyze uh, messages in media. So if I now take a look at, uh, or, or if I listen to the radio, and I'm, I'm listening to the news, uh, then the first thing I think, okay, that's on the radio. What's, what's the structure of radio? So what, what, what do I have to ex what I have to expect uh, on radio? One simple thing, for example, is uh, the communication is certainly not longer than two minutes or 90 seconds most often. So I, I have a pretty short and concentrated communication on the radio. If I want more background, more information, I, I wouldn't use radio because I know the structure of radio is different and does not allow for that. Okay, so uh, I take a look at the medium and the media reality I'm using. And the second thing is, uh, uh, is uh, in, in which uh, value sphere is this message located? Is the, the interest behind that, is that um, uh, economy? If it comes to adverts, advertising, it's pretty obvious. If, if, I, if I hear advertising on the radio, the idea is obviously people want to sell something to me. So it's about making money. They don't want to, they want to, don't want to become elected as counselor or something. They want to claim scientific truth. They just want to make money, marketing communication. <clears throat> if it comes to uh, the news, uh, it's most often it's a bit more difficult because it's uh, sometimes it's difficult to make a difference between uh, uh, messages that are connected to scientific ideas or to uh, uh, political ideas. But uh, well, I, I don't know how radio stations in the Czech Re Republic uh, communicate. In Austria, they, they hardly communicate scientific knowledge. Maybe you have public broadcasting, and in public broadcasting, they have one of these uh, broadcasting stations that are uh, um, <clears throat> broadcasting station that are uh, offering something that is called an uh, educational program. So they have occasionally, occasionally um, uh, radio programs that communicate scientific knowledge, but that's rare. But you can see how to how to analyze media messages, and well, obviously the basic uh, suggestion is teach people to analyze media messages this way. If you imagine uh, uh, taking a look, uh, for example, on the public debate on the coronavirus this way, uh, you immediately see that you change the debate about this communication quite a bit. But I didn't want to talk about the coronavirus uh, now. I, I want to make another connection. Uh, the difference I made uh, at the beginning 
And I used here again between these uh, monistic theories, one single point to organize everything and dualistic theory. So a network, a, heter a network of heterogeneities is um, uh, mirrored in information science by the difference between classifications and thesauri, thesaurus. In classifications, um, uh, in, in universal, cla universal classifications, in universal classifications, you have a single starting point, one single basic structure, and you use the single basic structure to organize and uh, arrange uh, all knowledge. So one single structure to organize all knowledge. In a thesaurus, uh, you have uh, a heterogeneity of different uh, thesaurus for the different spheres. Uh, if it comes to, to uh, uh, indexing scientific communication, uh, you and, and you use the thesaurus, you, you usually pick the thesaurus that meets uh, the scientific disciplines. So you have a thesaurus for education, you have a, a thesaurus for, for um, physics, you have a thesaurus for chemistry and so on. And this structure has been developed because uh, it becomes obvious that it's hardly possible to develop a single structure to describe just everything. Okay, from this perspective, uh, you might consider these suggestions about media realities and the value spheres as uh, index terms in a thesaurus that you can use to index messages in media. And by index indexing uh, the messages, you, you reflect the messaging messages and give them a, a meaning uh, from your perspective as an indexer. Okay, uh, I'm running out of time. Um, three minutes left for my last slide, uh, but uh, <clears throat> that's that's pretty short. Um, as because as I said uh, most of the things before, if you decide to use digital technology, uh, you buy the ideas that are expressed in digital technology. For example, um, if you use uh, digital technologies, you will change your idea uh, of family. You will change your idea of nation. And you will change your idea of a partnership. So what does happen to partnerships um, in a society, if most people in the society uh, use digital media quite often. So how is the, the basic structure, one of the basic structures uh, people use to organize the living together, how is it changed if you use digital technology? Um, I would expect from the structure of digital technologies two major changes. Um, the first major change is that relationships are not as, um, um, no, no, the commitment in relationship gets lower. The commitment gets uh, gets lower. Uh, the reason for that is that it is uh, in, in, in a digital world with all these different communication sh channels and media realities, it's very easy to change uh, a relationship and to change the community to, you belong to. You don't like this chat group, you go to another one. It's easy to change. If you imagine you live in a in a rural village 200 years ago, you couldn't change the community you belong to. Either you community communicate with the people in your village, or you do not communicate. You can't just change um, the community. With digital media, it's easy uh, to change the community, and that's an 
uh, idea that is expressed in the structure of universal Turing machines. What you see here on the, on the picture is the structure of universal Turing machines. Universal Turing machines uh, are capable of simulating universal Turing machines. And this capability of simulating universal Turing machines multiplies the communication worlds, the media worlds. And this is multiplication of media worlds. It's easier to change between media worlds. And if you use digital technology quite a bit, you transfer this structure to what you do with your friends. Second effect is uh, in this structure, you become the center because uh, the only constant element in all these changing, uh, moving between the media realities and all this move, movement between the uh, value spheres, the only constant element for you is yourself. So you become more important. So the world is something that is there for you. So, and if you are now uh, putting your own focus on yourself quite a bit and the commitment in relationship gets lower, your tendency to change your relationship to look for a new partner increases. So uh, your idea of partnership is probably changed if you use uh, digital media and you do the same if you apply digital technology in educational contexts. And just two keywords, uh, since I'm already 30 seconds behind my time limit, just two keywords. Interactivity is a message of digital media. So as soon as you start to apply digital technology in schools, interactivity becomes more important. Uh, a second thing uh, that becomes more important is participation. Uh, yeah, you're probably aware of that if you use digital media, you're all the time doing something. You are doing something. You're in, in contrast to, to, to a paper or book, if I read a paper, I, I, I'm not doing much. I'm just sitting there and read. If I use a mobile, I'm doing something all the time. So activity, participation becomes more important. So if you want to teach with educational technology, um, you um need to consider teaching with uh, interactive and participative teaching methods uh, don't try to communicate the monistic theories i think that's pretty difficult because this single truth is kind of uh, cut down to uh, a world of different realities and different truths Okay, uh, I wanted to discuss a little bit uh, the idea of uh, how, how uh, you can uh, use this uh, idea in libraries, in public libraries, for example, and create some suggestions for uh, communicating media literacy, uh, critical media literacy in public libraries. But well, I think the time, <laughs> I talked five minutes too long for that. I think uh, we can still take like um, time until 5.40 if uh, there's anything anyone can want to discuss or any question. Yeah, should we do a little group discussion just, just three, four, five minutes again to, to bring up some ideas of what, what can be the, how can library education support critical media literacy? Okay, but first, oh, maybe if there I, are I'm any a... questions, uh, last chance probably to ask something before we split. No? Okay, so let's do that. Critical media literacy. Yeah, okay, so how can uh, public libraries, uh, public library education support uh, building in terms of critical media literacy? Um, Let's do a quick, just, just, just two or three minutes, uh, some ideas.
So thank you very much. Um, maybe we can just jump into the ideas of room three. That was uh, Daniel, Christina, and I uh, don't know what is Mate or Mate is probably the first name, isn't it? Daniel, what do you think? Any ideas of uh, how libraries can support uh, critical media literacy? Looks like none. Uh, maybe Christina? Uh, we thought about uh, the <clears throat> some workshops or something like that for people, uh, which can uh, bring uh, information about critical, critical thinking. Yeah, it's probably a pretty good idea. What you can easily do is, uh, for example, pick pick some of the uh, objects in the library and uh, uh, ask kids to analyze uh, these objects. It's, but I'm, I'm not depending on the library, of course, but for example, some libraries offer us something like uh, newspapers, uh, magazines, and books. So you can pick... Uh, the things and uh, conduct workshops where, where people can start to analyze these, these media. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, maybe uh, uh, another room. Uh, how about room eight? That was, uh, uh, no, Peter again. Sorry, uh, no, they already <laughs> I already asked you. I just jumped to room 10. That was uh, Michaela, uh, Simona. Simona, what do you think? Nobody there? Um, so Michaela, can you hear me? No, maybe already gone. Uh, so about uh, how about room 12? That was Jana, Martin and Bawa. Yes, I'm here uh, before we talked, but I don't mind. Uh, well, it was very difficult to answer this question because uh, I don't work at libraries and uh, how, to, how to support media literacy. Well, uh, the idea was to go through an experience because if you go through experience you can uh, have the first person experience and this is the most important and to learn the media literacy via this well um, i don't know any other yeah i think that's a pretty good idea because if you if you ask uh, for that you are, you are suggesting people to start this this movement between the different spheres and uh, that's the best thing you can do to ask people to start this movement between the different spheres of course you can add some information about uh, uh, the different spheres about different media systems about like like uh, about genres genres are an interesting uh, terminology to to reflect media and develop an own position towards media yes, uh, did you mm -hmm. and of course the libraries should be as, as the, the professionals then these should prepare uh, very well uh, handouts uh, which should be uh, meaningful and uh, based on this experience yeah, yeah, pretty good full idea. Of time and full of information. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a pretty good idea to give some information and then then uh, uh, offer possibilities to make the uh, the experience. Uh, can you imagine that libraries also support students in communicating in the public sphere? Yes, of course. That's great. <laughs> Not so obviously, I well, think most people. Yes, it should, it should be. It should be the change of libraries. Yes, yeah, so uh, establishing libraries kind of a, 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 a place of communication, a public sphere of libraries are places of public communication, aren't they? 
Yes, they are. I agree. That's, yeah, that's one of the basic ideas. So why not asking the visitors to communicate and not only to communicate within the library, but also uh, <clears throat> a little bit with the world, at least around the library by, by using digital channels. Uh, maybe in, in schools, you can do something like uh, creating a school paper so the kids can create a school paper and uh, give this to all the the other students and uh, create a public a school public maybe uh, creating a kind of a library public would be an option too okay uh, maybe one one last uh, suggestion uh, how about uh, room 18 that was uh, christian uh, Fantishek and Thomas. Uh, Christian suggests, <coughs> suggests itself for me. Can you hear me? Uh, hello, I don't think Christian is there, or maybe he is, but uh, uh, we spoke with, um, well, um, we spoke about workshops and um, also, and we spoke about how, uh, well, the workshops should be really specialized on uh, different groups, for example, like uh, young people or elderly people, because um, you know you cannot make a, a workshop for for everybody um, yeah. to understand that, right? So, and also for the workshops, you really need to have the technology. Um, uh, for example, if you want to make a workshop, I don't know for um, uh, virtual reality, then you really need to acquire this and and so on. So we talked about this. Yeah, you can. You, you, what you might also do is uh, pick pick other topics that are heavily debated in the public sphere. Uh, for example, here in in Austria, a uh, fake news. Uh, 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 debated very often so workshops on fake news are something you you, you probably you will probably find an audience yeah. and that's and that's quite interesting to 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 start to reflect on 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 uh, on, on fake news with this uh, critical media literacy debate and if you do not ask at, at first the question what 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 is truth but the first question should be, what is the truth system we are discussing here? This news, is this referring to uh, other political interests, other economical interests, are there scientific interests? So what is the truth where we need to refer to to analyze these communications? Uh, one other thing that, that, that picks an audience, at least in Austria, of course, in different countries, say the situation is different, is something like uh, violence, violence in media, or uh, um, uh, cyber mobbing. So can just pick one of these uh, 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 kind of uh, often communicated topic uh, where, where people can associate something this. And then, of course, uh, if you discuss uh, something like violence in the media with 16-year-olds, uh, they have certainly uh, different static points than 60 years old, uh, obviously. So quite a challenge uh, for librarians, I think, to uh, develop uh, opportunities for uh, different audiences, different people. Maybe it's a good idea to create something uh, like a, a network and exchange ideas with other libraries. Okay, one last thing. I, I, I Probably you have discussed this. I just uh, wanted to, to state this. One, one thing that might be interesting is uh, offering kind of a media lab. So a laboratory where, where people can uh, do experience, experiments with media, with translation, with the translation of uh, ideas between different media and uh, experience this translation process, which is the core of becoming a person this way. Okay, my last remark for today. Any questions, suggestions? Uh, okay, then I hope you liked the show. <laughs> Thank you very much for your attention. It was a great one. Thank you, Professor. You're welcome. Thank you very much.
hope to see you again. Have a nice day. Bye. So do we. Bye. Hello. Thank you very much. It was great. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye. Yeah, thank you so much for the lecture. I think it was really interesting. And well, I wish we could stay longer and discuss <laughs> discuss discuss everything, but unfortunately <laughs> time is up. So yeah, we can set up a little cooperation project project if you like. Yeah. <laughs> we are, we kind of already did. <laughs> Be careful with your class, yeah, because it will definitely be great for some other courses or classes. So maybe we will, or maybe you will hear from us sooner than you'd expect. Yeah. yeah. No, no, no. Well, I, I, I like to discuss these ideas and uh, to exchange ideas. So if there are other opportunities, uh... I'm pretty sure that something will definitely come out. So don't do it. <laughs> I, I, believe this is, I believe this is not our, our last part. <laughs> yeah, sounds great. I'm not afraid of public communication. <laughs> so oh, this is a serious <laughs> offer. So if you if you if you if you are interested in further corporations, uh, I look forward to it. Okay, thanks again for your offer. Okay, Thank you so very much. You heard everyone <laughs> who okay. is interested in further cooperation can. Thank you very much for being here again. Have a nice day. See you. Bye. Goodbye. <laughs>